So we are recording. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to you, Pam. It is still May 28th, 2024. This is a regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee, opening the meeting at 6.31 p.m. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extends by Chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extends by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 23, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public is possible, but every group, every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. I am going to go through the call to order and I'll start with uh, Councillor Haneke. Can you hear us? Thank you. Councillor Ette. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Jennifer Tao. Present. Pam Rooney's present and can hear you all. Uh, there are no public hearings tonight, but we will open to public comment. We have at least three attendees in the audience. And I'm going to announce at the beginning of this meeting that we're going to have a public comment period right now, but then I would like to reopen it to conversation or another another round of public comment at the end of our conversation about solar bylaw. And if there is anybody interested in nuisance bylaw, I can do the same thing at the end of the nuisance conversation. So for right now, we will start with the um, public hearing at this right now. Anyone who would like to speak, please raise your hand and kindly limit your comments to matters within the jurisdiction of the CRC. I don't see any hands. I suspect people may want to comment after they have heard the discussion. So we'll Give it another minute and then move on to our first action item. Okay, I still don't see any hands. So we're going to move to item number four, which is the action items and start with the solar bylaw. I was expecting uh, that Stephanie who compiled for us would um, be here to walk us through, but I do not see her. And I'm going to, I'm going to look to uh, Councillor Haneke, if that works, to, if if you were prepared to help do that. Otherwise, Christine Brestrup, uh, yeah. to, oh, there's, there's Stephanie, excellent. Stephanie, were you prepared to uh, actually, uh, pull this up on your screen and go through it with us? Or can any of the rest of us do that for you? Any of you can do it, but I have it set up and I'd be happy to do it for you, whatever you prefer. That would be great if you're all set up to do it. Sure, absolutely. So- uh, the Could I say first, I wanna thank you and Chris for the work you've done and Mandy for the helping, but I particularly wanna thank you, Stephanie and Chris for doing this work. Thank you. Stephanie did the heavy lifting this time. I've been sort of double thanks for you. Absent <laughs> absent minded because of our not absent minded, yeah. but our um change in staffing has really hit us mm -hmm. like a truck. So yeah, Stephanie so took over and um thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, you're welcome. And and I will also express appreciation for having assistance from staff because we certainly didn't do that with the, well, we did have staff, but not writing the rental registration. So thank you. Um, as suggested by Stephanie with her compilation, she took all of the comments from each and every one of us who wrote in and simply said, does this look like a bylaw element? <clears throat> and dumped it into one bucket called possible bylaw elements. And if we were to go through, I think we could, in fairly short order, uh, well, 
confirm that we think that these are bylaw elements. If, and I don't want to do too much more talking, um, the, the other options as we structure this bylaw are that we identify some components that was put together that were put together by the solar bylaw working group who amassed a, a lot of information for us um, are some of those components things that we would recommend becoming just um, sort of a stand standalone boilerplate conditions that the ZBA or the the permit granting authority should refer to and try to accommodate, um, or should they be, in fact, elements of um, the bylaw itself? And recognize, and so one of the conversation pieces is <clears throat> if it's in a bylaw, it is, it is a requirement. A condition, if chosen, if adopted by the permit granting authority becomes part of the permit. So that condition is in fact um, part of the resolution. It's just that it's not necessarily a hard and fast requirement. So with that, Pat, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, Chris Ting's uh, memo dated May 5th, uh, 10th. And it uh, talks about this issue and um, her recommendation and the one that I can support is to retain section 17.04 submittal requirements. Um, um, and in within uh, within the bylaw, since okay. they're specific to solar installations. Uh, and this is um, anyway, this is different than the recommendation she and Stephanie gave before but I would like to see us retain those things. Okay, so we'll get to 1704 in hopefully just a couple minutes. Stephanie, do you want to bring this up on the screen and we'll start from the top? Sure, can I, um, I just wanted to give a very quick overview of how I came to this version of the draft. Um, and just very quickly, so I had comments from, um, at least four members. And so I looked at those comments and in some cases there were recommendations to just take little bits and pieces from certain sections and then take everything else out. Um, but if one member recommended that everything stay in, I kept it in. So there's probably more here than some would have expected, but that's only because somebody else suggested it stay in. And for instance, I know there was a big discussion about the stormwater regulations at the last meeting, and ultimately it sounded like everyone was in agreement that it should come out. But just based on the feedback that I had from people's documents, and I think some of the comments were even prior to the last meeting, mm -hmm. things got retained. So, you know, there may be things that you just decide to just all we've discussed this, this will take out, that should, should move it along a little more quickly. Um, so otherwise that's what we have now is just what was left. If anybody, if there was a section that everybody sort of agreed didn't need to be there or language that there was agreement that could come out, it came out. So that's the draft before you. So I will share my screen now with you. Okay, I do wanna pose a question to the rest of the committee is as we go through, there have been, um, I have received comments on different sections. And the question would be, do we want to take time tonight to add in comments or do we want to move through at a pace, but make it perhaps make a note that that comment needs to be added as we come to those. Pat, you, you still have your hand up, do you want to? Fine. Yeah, I still have my hand up. I mean, I'm, I'm trying, I don't, if we only are going through it tonight, which might be valuable, I don't know, as Stephanie has created it, as long as we're not voting on, on keeping things, I can go along with that to understand her thinking and stuff. But I feel like there are things I want added back and, and stuff like that, that I want to be able to discuss, if not tonight, very soon. Okay. Councilor Haneke. 
I'm still trying to figure out exactly what we're doing when we go through it. Are we commenting substantively about things? Are we trying to deal with wording? Are we trying to say, you know, I still don't like X, Y, Z in here? Like, like how substantive are we getting into it is question number one. And then question number two regarding comments we've seen from non-committee members. Um, they're valuable, but I don't necessarily want to favor any one person over some other public member of the public's thoughts by automatically putting one person in because they sent us something ahead of time versus somewhere else. And so I think we have to be consistent about whose comments are at this point are going in um, to whatever document we're doing and how we're discussing stuff because I'm still, I, I, I guess I still don't know I, I I need help understanding when we start talking about section 1700 intent and purpose, what are we talking about? Um, and, and whose comments are we putting in or what type of comments are we putting in or not? Um, so I guess I need help. Yep. Thank you. And I think that's exactly why we wanted to talk about this before we started. Um, Chris Prespo, please. So what Stephanie and I decided last week when Stephanie was working on this document was that we thought it made most sense to evaluate the document per um, section and just say, yes, this section belongs in here. That's what we think it should be. And then move on to the next section rather than getting involved. And I know there are a lot of questions and comments that people have about the details, but we thought it would be better just to evaluate this um, as in, does this intent and purpose, you know, is that supposed to be part of the bylaw or should that be somewhere else? So then we would have a whole document that we could then begin to kind of go through minutely and pick apart the words and add things, et cetera. Um, but for right now, we thought it made most sense to just say, yes, this should be in the bylaw or no, it shouldn't be. That's my opinion, and I think that was Stephanie's opinion. But of course, you're able to have your your opinion. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm sort of skipping back to one of um, the questions that Councilor Haneke asked about, you know, how different members of the public weigh in. And I guess I do draw a distinction between, I mean, I think that if we're getting some feedback from members of the solar bylaw working group that they were that group was put together because they really have an expertise in this area so which is why at the last meeting you know i kind of threw out was there a way for us to actually have a conversations with mem a conversation with members of the solar bylaw working group i just you know they have so much more expertise than i have that you know i would really appreciate the chance to have a conversation. So I I know that, um, you know, we want to give all of the public equal opportunity, but I think if we have a body, they sent us this bylaw, and I think for us just to pick it up when it's a subject matter that's very new to some of us, it would be helpful if we could still, you know, have a conversation or somehow liaise with, with that group. So I just, that was my comment. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't. I don't um, have my raise my hand feature because I'm sharing the document. I can't find it. So okay. I, you don't. You can call on me. I just want you to know that my hand is raised. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to say something right now? Because actually, you were behind my below my screen. Um, I I do want to respond actually to um, Councillor Tobbs' comment in that um, yes, I agree that. There are members of the Solar Bylaw Working Group who have definitely spent time on this document, but as a body, they came to a decision and the document that you received is what they agreed to. And I, 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 as much as I can appreciate, there are definitely some comments that should be brought in. I think they shouldn't come in before the rest of other public comment. I think that you have the document that they all concurred and came to agreement on and they gave you the language that they agreed on. And at this point, they weren't always, their opinions and their comments weren't always, um, 
unanimous and they didn't always agree and they had a lot of discussion. So that I think taking in one person's comments at this time would not necessarily reflect the view of the entire body. And I would just save those comments for public comment. And that's my opinion. And I think Chris could weigh in on that as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Ette. Um, thank you, Stephanie. That was the um, point I wanted to make, which is that um, even as much as we would have we would want to have a conversation with the by the working group. That's not what we would have right now because we do not have all the members. Instead, we are getting one member or two or three providing inputs. In that case, it would be preferable to have that as some part of um, the public comments just so that it doesn't tilt um, the skills unlike what would have happened within the group itself, where they would have had a conversation before bringing the actual um, document. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So I'm getting a sense that that perhaps, well, first of all, there is, I think all of us agree that there is some redundancy within the document. There's a lot of verbiage that isn't necessarily um, pointed, specific, and, and cogent um, as, as a tight, tightly written bylaw wants to be. But I think I would agree with the approach that Stephanie and Christine are suggesting at this point that we in fact go through at a fairly high level and say, in general, is section 1700 in these words, um, or these paragraphs appropriate for bylaw. And then and if and if we are missing some and someone says, well, I actually wanted um, the third paragraph of that, let's add it in, I think that's that's fine. I think it's still getting a just a really basic starting point that we're gonna winnow down as we go. So that's that's the approach that we'll we'll try that. If it doesn't work, we'll try another approach. So we'll we'll start with Article 17, Section 1700, Intent and Purpose. Does anyone feel the need to uh Councillor Haneke? Um I think a purpose statement is consistent with how the zoning bylaw operates now um, and how some of our general bylaws operate, but the second provision, the second paragraph is not a purpose statement. Second paragraph is something else that I believe needs to be its own section. I don't know what it would be called, but it's a statement for some sort of attempt, although I would change some language, um, of determining if there are conflicts or restatements and and sections of the zoning bylaw if there are multiple sections of the zoning bylaw that would apply to a particular thing being decided it's a statement that determines which thing applies um, which is not an intent or purpose in my mind it's a completely different type of thing and to bury it in intent and purpose, I think is wrong. So I would bring out the second paragraph as a, at, at this point as a potentially separate section, but I don't know what I'd name that. Enforcement, conflicts, and they choice with, of applicability, I don't know what I'd call it, but I think it's a different for now. Or that we make, or that we make note that it. Can we do track changes so that we can make a note of what Mandy just shared? Thank you. I'm gonna uh, see if that if that works. <clears throat> I'm 
we could just add a we could just add a comment. Yep. Actually, that's Mandy who said it. Yeah. Oh, Stephanie, are you doing the change? That's fine then. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's Stephanie doing it. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's fine. I can, I'll put initials after who made the comment, if that's Thank helpful. you so much. Sure, no problem. There's quite, in the, in the original copy that we got, there's quite a lot under this first uh, section 17.00, which it seems that mm, nobody suggested including in the bylaw except for the this um, last sentence, this last paragraph, that they take precedent over other le less restrictive sections. So we, I think we can move on to section 17.01. And I want to clarify again, we're only dealing with what we're seeing here. We're not okay. adding comments right now. Exactly. Okay, keep going. As much as I would love to, we're not. Uh, Councilman Haneke. I guess this 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 goes to what are we doing? doing. <laughs> Similar to Pat's question. Because um, I don't quite understand the need for an applicability section on its own um although it seems to this is where i don't know how how in depth we're getting i most of our bylaw if you think about zoning bylaw consistency the the sign regulations doesn't have an applicability per se, or, you know, it, it, it defines something and, you know, and, and then I go on and say, but this one then gets rid of stuff. But I look at the use table that just says large scale ground mounted solar special permits across. And I've heard Chris say, well, some things are not special permits. Some things are just, and that this doesn't apply to certain large scale ground mount. And so then I'm curious, I'm getting to a point here about other sections. I'm curious, well, if if there's a large scale ground mount uh, system that's greater given the definition later on of 250 kilowatts DC that is mounted on a parking lot, what regulations do apply? And do we actually need a section in the bylaw for that type of system? Because it seems like this is trying to carve out a certain type of LG PI that the use table is not. And so I don't know the consistency with applicability in general in various zoning bylaws as to whether this is necessary at all um, or whether it can be deleted with better definitions of LGPI in the definition section. I'm looking at Chris Brestrup. I think Mandy has many good points in what she just said, but I think an applicability section is useful here. And there are probably a lot of things that could be added to this, such as whether this section applies to solar mounts in uh, parking lots. Um, but I think it's really important to, you know, distinguish this large scale ground mounted solar arrays from other things that might be, you know, roof mounted or um, actually this, it, what it says at the end of the first paragraph is this bylaw is not intended to regulate systems of less than 250 kilowatts um, or roof mounted systems or solar parking canopies. So it's really meant to just focus on the ground mounted um, installations. So it probably needs more work, but I think it's important to have it here. Applicability, a section on applicability. And that is typical of many bylaws that I've read. In fact, I'm, I think that most of the solar bylaws that I read had an applicability section. 
Thank you. Pat. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I was going to say basically what Chris said, and I want to support that as a decision. Uh, and we might want to think about adding something, but that would be at another time in terms of parking lots and things like that. Or panels, solar panels on buildings. Yep. And parking lot. Yeah. There is a little bit about, yeah. Yeah. Um, anybody, I, I'm comfortable with it, with it uh, describing essentially the extent of what this bylaw covers. And maybe it ends up in the intent and purpose section rather than, than here, um, but that's a step two. So for now, some of the um, I can ask you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, section seventeen oh two. Oh, Jennifer, you have your hand up. Sorry, it's not important. I was just going to agree that I think it should be there someplace. If somebody, a member of the public is just, I mean, somebody might say, you know, what do I need to do if I just want a solar panel on my roof? And this tells you, you don't, this bylaw doesn't apply to you. Uh, next, the next is statements regarding special requirements for LGPIs on farmland and forest land. So this is specifically farmland and forest land. And so far, we have it. Uh, Anarchy. In my Sorry. mind, counselor's hard to get out. <laughs> to Go me, ahead. this is something that is far outside what a zoning bylaw normally talks about, um, outside of a purpose statement. Um, and a lot of it is somewhat self-serving in my mind um, that we could fight over and argue over and disagree with on a lot of the assumptions that are within it. I would delete the whole section. Um, I guess I'll be coy and rather ask what is the purpose of the nexus statements because my view i think in what i had sense as well is that i didn't see the need for it in the bible i'm going to chris because i know she was part of those conversations <laughs> yeah i would say that we developed these nexus statements somewhere in the middle of working on the bylaw and we weren't sure if we would have um, strong limitations on placing solar in forest land or on farmland. And so these statements are meant to support limitations that we might have on placing forest, uh, solar on forests or farmland. Now, I think in the end, we came up with not much limitation on solar on forest lands. And so this particular section, this nexus statement that would tie those limitations to some reason, you know, why in Amherst do you want to limit these things on forest lands? That's what this is about. Maybe we don't need it since we're not really limiting solar installations on forest lands. In terms of farmlands, we are limiting solar installations on farmlands to the extent that if there are certain kinds of farmland, then we are we would require that they be treated as agrivoltaic installations, not just regular installations. Of course, there is an out if you can, um, you know, hire a consultant who's, who says it's either technically or financially unfeasible to do agrivoltaics on your farmland then you're not required to do that. But in any event, 
this um, nexus statement is meant to support or back up limitations that we put in our bylaw that um, would limit solar installations on farmland. And we were, it was suggested to us that we should do this by Jonathan Murray, who's the um, attorney from KP Law, who helped us with this bylaw, helped us to formulate our ideas. He didn't review the bylaw, but he helped us to formulate our ideas. And he said, it's important if, if you are going to limit, you know, put limitations on these installations that you make it clear as to why you're doing that. So that's what these two sections are about. And I agree that perhaps the forest one could be deleted but no. we might want to keep the farm one in because we are placing limitations on solar on farmland. I'm just going to com comment if I could on that. I mean, we haven't decided we don't need it for forest land yet. Um, Pat and then Councilor Ette. And then no, I want to go back to Mandy Jo to make sure she gets to hear her feedback. I think that the nexus statements are important, particularly since the state has said, hey, you can't limit solar. Um, and they're, we're trying to, un to defend the position that we're talking about the health and safety of our town so that the uh, language is very important. The forest land one is also important and should not be deleted. Um, you know, the state is moving forward with they're they're just going to be doing a whole bunch of stuff to take power away from the municipalities. This is not about power. This is addressing the arguments that we why I think Chris said it so much better than I do, but why we need the some of the regulations that we have. And, and I think it's critical to the bylaw. Jennifer, and then I want to yeah, I was just gonna say, I agree with what uh, Pat just said. I mean, I think this is, you know, just like our master plan. I mean, we do have some just basic, I guess, statements of value. And I think, I would think that this is shared by most of the community that in Amherst, you know, we do value our forest and for farmland. And it's, kind. Of, I th just think this is sort of the basis for why we're, developing a bylaw. So I, I think, and particularly now that I know that our attorney um, encouraged us to have this kind of a nexus statement, um, I, I think it should stay there. I certainly don't think it hurts. I don't think it's particularly controversial, I, which I know, is, you know, that could be controversial, but I, it just seems that I would think that this is based on our master plan and everything th that the way Amherst has set up its zoning and bylaws and how we do development that this is, it seems to me it reflects, it states a community value. Uh, Councilor Haneke. The master plan states a community value, but we don't rehash the master plan when we're writing a bylaw in zoning that talks about um, uh, inclusionary zoning. We didn't rehash that with an entire page of purpose statements that that set forth the community values. The regulation itself is supposed to set forth the community values by what we regulate and what we don't. I don't see, you know, I, I understand the attorney may have recommended this, but I read a lot of this and I'm trying not to get into my problems with actually some of the language. Um, and don't see a difference between this and a purpose statement. I don't see why we need a completely different section for it versus potentially if people want expanding a purpose statement a little bit, you know, I, I think some of my first, and, and that's that's where I trouble with what are we doing here with substance or not? You know, I, I had recommended a lot of deletion of the purpose statement be, and a lot of deletions of the nexus because I think there were like six different places, not six, but those two in particular, but also some other sections repeated stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, if we're going to have an, a, the nexus is essentially the purpose. 
Um, I don't see why we need two different ones. And I would argue also, it may not be controversial that we need solar. Um, but some people are saying it's controversial because they say that we can't have it on forest or we can't really have it on farmland. And so we need these nexus statements for reasons why we need to severely limit it on X, Y, and Z, yet there's no nexus statement as to the absolute need for converting and getting rid of fossil fuel generation at all. Um, and so I feel like this nexus statement is one-sided. It is not a nexus statement that supports solar per se. It is a nexus statement that supports not putting solar or severely regulating solar. It is a statement that supports in some sense severely regulating solar and not building solar in certain areas without any similar statements, at least in the same to the same extent of why it is so important to build a ton of solar to get us off fossil fuels. Um, there are some statements in there and I don't need people to say, well, we have some. Well, we don't have three pages of statements as to why we need to get off fossil fuels. We have two sentences versus two pages of nexus statements that this started with. So if for now we need something, I would put it in purpose and get rid of a nexus statement or at least move this right up after purpose instead of putting applicability in the middle of it. Um, but if we're not going to talk about substance and, and a desire to rewrite this at this point, I would say move it all to purpose. And when we deal with the substance of the purpose section, then we can talk about the substance of this too, but not have two separate sections. Thank you. I was actually had my hand up, but go ahead, Councilor Ete. Um, I think the nexus statement has the potential to be controversial. Um, and I also am not persuaded by how much force it carries by its presence in the bylaw. So does that mean you don't want it or do you think it's in the, it should not be part of the bylaw? Um, I, I still don't find it necessary. Yeah. Okay. Pat and then Pam. Go ahead. Um, I can go after you. I don't mind. Okay. I was I was gonna say I actually am thinking that um as I was reading it, that it it does seem to be part of the purpose for having a bylaw. And that if we can if we can take some of the key elements of why we want it. Um, I think it's been explained actually in the cover letter, we make a really good, uh, there's a good explanation of why we need solar. And if we are going to, um, we're not limiting solar necessarily, but we're more heavily managing solar arrays in forests and farmlands is the way I'm looking at it. Pat. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, uh, count, uh, I, I'm not comfortable with, uh, Mandy, with your talking about a severely and extremely limiting. Um, one of the things that's true is I think that this whole community, Amherst, supports um, addressing uh, the climate crisis, using, creating as much solar energy as we can. What this is about, the large scale ground mounted, is finding a balance between the need for those ground mounted, large ground mounted solar systems and the need to maintain uh, forests and as lungs. And, and if you look at other stuff from the state, it, it, it now addresses that more directly. And we can't, so we are trying to regulate how much of a forest can be taken apart, how it can be taken apart when it is taken apart, which I support, but how we balance that with the need 
to sequester carbon. So it, it's really, I think, uh, I think the two nexus statements are really critical. I would not necessarily be uncomfortable moving them to purpose. I can see that point, Mandy, but I think that um, eliminating them would be foolish. Thank you. Um, and I, I was going to note well, two things. One is that I'm planning to keep this discussion going until about quarter of eight. So good a good hour on this topic before we switch topics. Um, but just noting that Amherst is pretty consistently and purposefully uh, acquired farmland, farm and forest land um, for conservation. And that's sort of our, our lungs and, and breathing space for the town. And so I think um, I certainly support um, keeping some of the concepts of these nexus statements within reach in this bylaw. So when we talk about it, Again, some of these other some of these other sections have been um, there's a paragraph or two that's brought into the bylaw, and the rest we're saying may not apply. Frankly, I don't really want to stop and go through the nexus, you know, the seven or eight paragraphs of nexus statement to to do that, um, and would suggest that getting getting through and hearing feedback from the group tonight is a really good first step. I don't mind offering to help compile those thoughts and and start a process of maybe consolidating and moving things to where we talked about placing them. In which case, in which case we might look at these fairly extensive nexus statements and say which of these are the salient elements that we need to right. maintain. Does that feel comfortable, Pat? Yeah. Does anyone want to say anything else about section 1702? I don't see any hands. Okay. Stephanie, can you yes, proceed us along here? I'm checking, I'm checking three different versions to see if I missed anything from one version to the other. Um, well, we're just going through Stephanie's tonight. So maybe you Yeah, well, I know, but but I'm comparing it to my mine. So um, did anyone have any any concerns about the definitions being part of the bylaw? Looks like it looks like the entire uh, definitions. Uh, Haneke, counselor. I just want to be clear. I don't have problems with definitions in the zoning bylaw. I, my question at this point is, are we making note of things where since the com the committee hasn't decided whether it kind of wants to deal with this standalone or insert certain things into different parts of the zoning bylaw, other articles, and article uh, 12, I think, is our definition section of the thing. Mm -hmm. Should we be making note within this document of potential sections that once we've decided on potential language that we then have to make a decision on does it stay in article 17 or does it go to an x different article and so if we're making those notes now i would say that note goes with this section of a decision needs to be made as to whether to keep it in section 17 or put stuff into section well article 12 i think it is yeah any other comments on that while stephanie is Noting that, I, I would agree. Can 
opportunity to go live on him. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, section 1704, submittal requirements. So the, the initial conversation was uh, at first to perhaps put submittal requirements into rules and regulations. Um, it looks like at least one of us or all of us maybe have suggested that they do need to stay in the bylaw itself. Are there any comments about that? And we have 31, at the, at the moment there are 31 uh, elements to consideration for submittal requirements, which is pretty extensive. Mandy. Um, my comment goes back to, in some sense, the initial comment I had on article or section zero, that splitting out that last sentence. Um, I, at some point, I think we need to make a decision as to whether these are the only submittal requirements or whether the regulations submittal, the submittal requirements that are included in the regulations of the ZBA or planning board or building inspector also apply and then be very clear in the bylaw what that is, because at this point I've got concerns about conflicting requests. Christine. Yeah, I think we make a statement in the beginning here that both the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals have rules and regulations that include submittal requirements. And then we also say that in addition to those submittal requirements, these the following things are required for large-scale solar installation. So I think it, um, it makes sense to me to have this list in the bylaw and then to refer back to the zoning bylaw and planning, or excuse me, the zoning board and planning board rules and regs. I think there may be some minor things in this list that are also contained in those rules and regs lists, but um, I didn't think it was worth my time to go through it and, you know, parse those things out. But for the most part, these things listed, these 35 things, really are specific to the solar bylaw. Um, and if you want to get specific, I, well, I don't want to get specific now, but we can have that conversation later. So I think most of this is related to the solar installations and not to the general, not to a general project. And whether it stays in here or goes into rules and regs, I think you could put it in rules and regs, but then the zoning board and the planning board would need to adopt those as changes to their rules and regs. Anyone else have a comment? And thank you, thank you, Mandy, for that. I I would I would agree that that um, keeping the submittal requirements for this um, for this topic, for this type of development, um, is appropriate to keep in a bylaw. Um, the the sections in the zoning in the zoning bylaw that, for instance, deal with in the rules and regs for the zoning board of appeals deals with Chapter Forty B, you know, um, affordable housing developments, and there's some specific requirements in addition to the usual things that get you know brought to the table this is pretty lengthy and and seems much easier for a developer to find if it's all in one place than having to jump back and forth between the zoning board rules and regs which are hard to find because they're not on their main website any other comments uh i saw councillor ette had hand up for a second I think I'd requested that it go in um, rules and regs, but having listened to some of what has been said, I think I, I'll refrain from making that right now. Did you say consider moving consider moving these to the rules and regs? 
I am partially persuaded by what has been said. So uh, that's that's why I dropped my hand. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Any other comments on 17.04? And again, and again, I want to be really clear that we aren't getting into the details because there's a lot of editing that could happen in here and winnowing it down. So 1705, 1705, uh, oh, Jennifer, sorry. Yeah, no, that's why I have a question, like, uh with the um with the submittal requirements so how and who is going to decide what would be winnowed down i mean personally i can't weigh in on that that this submittal so who, i guess that's what i'm asking who has the expertise a staff clearly does but is, so will staff decide that i don't see how this committee goes through and decides oh we need this submittal requirement but we don't really need that one So it's just sort of a question when we say we'll come back to it is, you know, does that happen literally as we're in a meeting like we're having now? Yeah. Or or with some or with some pre-work done so that the editing is is obvious. And I was talking about editing being not necessarily that you would drop item three, but it was that there's a lot of for instance, under lighting or screening and planting, there could be two or three sentences that say what you really need. And then the rest is um, material that maybe the ZBA should take into consideration when they're looking at a project. It's it's more the the adjectives that are that are sort of added to the the basic noun. Chris, move your hand up. Yeah, I thought that um, Ms. Taub was referring to the submittal requirements and wondering how this group here, CRC members, could winnow that list of submittal requirements, not being very um, maybe technically knowledgeable about um, solar installations. So she was going back to 1704. And I guess right. what I would suggest is that um, we will talk to Rob Mora, who's the building commissioner, and you know he can advise us about things that are contained in here that may or may not be important or useful. In my opinion, I'd say most of these things are important or useful. I could probably you know make arguments about deleting some of them, but I think having Rob Mora review this is going to be helpful to you in deciding which of these submittal requirements are necessary and realistic. Thank you. And, and also I would add to that, that we in fact haven't had the general staff reviews yet. We haven't had CONCOM, we haven't had, you know, those kinds of groups actually look at it from their technical perspectives to confirm or suggest ed editing these sections. So it's yeah, it's not going to all be on the on the back of the CRC for sure. Pat, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say to Jennifer and to all of us that what Chris gave clear reasons why she supported these being the submittal requirements being in the solar bylaw. She also said there were some minor things that she didn't go through, and but she that's certainly something she could do. And her uh, referring this to Rob Mara, et cetera. Uh, I think that's how, and then we will hear back from Chris and Rob, and, and then we'll be able to make our decision. But she's already said that it be that it's these are important. Right. Um, no, I, I think they are. That's what I'm saying. Who am I to say what something yeah. should come out? So okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Design standards. There we go. Um, trying to stay away from actual language, um, 
fencing, there's a section of the bylaw section 6.2 that talks about fencing. So I think we need to decide at some point um, when we're talking about fencing that uh, at a future time, whether it stays in this article or whether it goes to 6.2 or whether article 6.2 um, or section 6.2 is sufficient or what might be added there. So I'd, I'd like a comment that says that we don't lose the fact that there's zoning bylaw bylaw language regarding fencing already and we need to make sure that we need to cross-reference and decide, make some decisions with that as well as making decisions as to what the language is. Um, Signage, um, the same thing I just said with fencing goes to signage, but it's Article 8 um, and all. Um, visual impact, everything after the first paragraph, the such assessment is preferred to include the following and beyond, one, two, three, and all those numbers, I think is more appropriately a submittal requirement than it is a a standard. If you're asking for an assessment, you're asking for something to be submitted. So I would like to see much of the visual impact, the assessment language at least moved organizationally to submittal requirements at some point before we discuss it, because it's not a standard per se, it's asking you to submit a plan in a sense and what that plan includes. Um, the slopes and soils section um, goes to something that I would talk about later, which is I believe we need, I don't know whether slopes and soils is, is the right thing, but it might be considered this, that we need a section on dimensional standards. Um, potentially modifying the dimensional standards table in the bylaw that currently is there or having a specific dimensional standards table for large scale ground mount or any other type of ground mount solar that deals with setbacks, that deals with um, screening distances. I think screening in here sometimes talks about how many feet it needs to be. Um, but I think we need to consider a separate section or table that deals with some of that and consolidates some of these dimensional type length width slopes into one section, one potential table. And slopes and soils is a possibility that that might be a place to put that. I don't know whether it, it works there, but it's a possibility for that. Thank you. Yeah, um, and and good point. It, it uh, a lot of those visual impacts are not standard. Um, slopes slope and soil though is um, just as a landscape architect. Uh, the steeper the slope, the higher the runoff rate, the 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 greater the erosion. And I think we need to say something in here very specifically about you can't build over fifteen percent. I mean, you can mow on a three percent slope. But you know, as it gets any any steeper than that, um, you have a hard time maintaining your vegetation that is supposed to slow down your erosion or, or your runoff. So I would say fifteen percent at, at a maximum. Um, so I would certainly I would certainly want to keep in slope and soil. Yeah, in here. But I but I like the idea of a dimensional table because it is kind of scattered throughout this document and it seems like it's um, it contradictory in some places, especially in the water protection area and the distance from wells versus distance from property lines. Anything else on the um, and the screening and planting as well just is you know there's a lot of stuff in here that some of which could be a nice condition for ZBA to, to think about. But in general, in my mind, having the section in here is, is, a, is appropriate. It just needs to be parsed out better.
Anything else on design standards? The next section, special requirements, it's 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 really special requirements for farmland and forest. Any comments on this section? I have a couple. Oh, go ahead. Yandy. So again, trying not to get into the substance of stuff. Um, yep. Some of this is what a soil plan is, which is not, is more to me a submittal requirement than a a a a land use threshold or maximum or minimum or some sort of land use requirement it's more of you know one of this is um shall you know conduct a baseline soil health analysis well that that fits to me more with a submittal requirement of submit a soil health analysis something right um you know um reporting requirements anything with reporting should be moved to a section on reporting um so that all the reporting requirements are in the same section um you know and so i and then the title special requirements gets to me because it doesn't uh, why are these not called design why aren't these part of the design standards section you know or or something like that i i'm not quite understanding why it's a separate section um because it's like design requirements for farmland well that that's a design standard potentially um you know submitting types of crops to be planted if you're talking about farmland well, that's a submittal requirement, not really a design requirement. So I think this is a section that potentially, you know, an annual report, a de detailed design of solar layout. Well, isn't that part of the submittals? I think this whole section needs to really be gone through and almost split up section by section into the things that are submittal requirements, the things that are design requirements, and then potentially as we get into talking about actual language, deleting the whole section that's just titled special requirements, because I think a lot of it goes into other sections more appropriately. Yeah, uh, Christine. I just wanted to make the point that there are reporting requirements at different points along the way. And those often are not at the same time that submittals are being made. So the submittal requirements in general refer to what do you need to submit to get your application going? And then um, there are reporting requirements um, during construction and reporting requirements after construction, both to talk about erosion control and also to talk about how is the site um, maintaining itself over time. So I think in my opinion, they would not; these things would not be submittal requirements, although you could have a section on reporting, which would talk about, you know, if you need to submit a report as part of your application, and then if you have a report that's due during construction, and then if you have another report due um, after construction, maybe you want to split it up that way. To me, it makes more sense to have the reporting in with the issues that are being discussed, but that's something that you can decide yourselves. I just wanted to make that point that the reporting takes place at different times and has different um, purposes. Thanks. 
Thank you. Always helpful to understand the background of, of the structure. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was going to say in my in my marked up copy, this is part of what the section looks like. It's 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 not all it's not all straightforward. Um, any other comments? And we can move to section seventeen oh seven. And Stephanie, again, thank you for taking notes. My pleasure. So this this section, um, Mandy. So ecosystem services seems, this section seems to apply if neither, if the uh, if the section seventeen oh six doesn't apply, if you start reading about what um, requirements for in forest lands are, and then it, at one point it defined what that was um, requirements for um, on farmland that talks about what farmland is in terms of what that means, and then there was an ecosystem services that applied in if i read this correctly to things that to to land that didn't qualify under either of the forest land or farmland in section 1706 so if if that's the case it seems like this is more another subsection of that other section almost not its own section if it's really again thinking about the forest land, these these e uh, special requirements for forest land, does maxim e ecosystem services doesn't seem to apply to that, and so is it in some sense a subsection of seventeen oh six, not its own section number one. Number two, my same comments apply um, ecosystem services plan. So yep. is that a submittal requirement? Is that something else? The annual report should be in a report i'd really like to see a reporting section so that we know how many reports are being asked for and i love the idea of the reporting section being split up of construction reports post construction operational reports sort of thing but but i think there's a lot of reporting requirements in here that we don't actually realize how much reporting is being asked for and whether they are conflicting or complementary or um overly burdensome because they are not all in one section. So I, again, I think I'd go with, I'm not sure this is its own section because it only applies to subsets of the developments. And so is it more part of design guidelines for X types of large scale ground mounted design guidelines for Y types? And I think we need to be clearer about some of this because a lot of this in the prior section seemed to only apply to a subset of large scale ground mount. And that gets confusing to someone trying to build something as to which sections, if any, do they have to follow. So I guess I'm saying I'd put it with wherever we're putting some of the other section 17.06 stuff, as well as split out the reports and any of the plans into their appropriate other subsections. I would concur with that. And again, some so you have a plan submittal. Um, it, it doesn't. It, I mean, it's got some sort of general. It, it's got some material that that could very well just be a, a general condition that that the permit granting authority needs to consider as well. Okay, 1708, dimensional standards. So this is pretty, this is a pretty short section, um, but it covers, it, it's really, I only see one actual setback requirement of 50 feet of front yard. So we know that there are other 
um, dimensions that have been mentioned in other places, they need to be all in the same uh, section. Um, Dave. Yeah, I wondered if we could go back to that last section just for a minute. 1707. Yeah, 17.07. Again, going back to something Mandy said quite a while ago about, you know, are we trying to encourage these systems being built in Amherst in the right location, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing that occurred to me here, and I, I may be off base, but, you know, I was just thinking of, a, you know, let's say a 10 acre solar project um on forest land or farmland if i was just trying to think of the equivalent if if somebody proposed a subdivision of seven acres and i was comparing that to a seven acre solar field would we require an ecosystem services plan for that subdivision i think the answer is no but i i just kind of wonder and maybe Stephanie or, or Christine, because they were part of the, the working group's uh, efforts. Uh, it just doesn't have to be answered tonight, but it's just an interesting question. We don't, we don't require anything close to that for a subdivision of eight acres or 10 acres. Um, I, I don't think we require them at all for subdivisions. Not that we have a lot of subdivisions, but we could. Um, so just a question to put out there. Why do we have it here? Why are we asking these developers to do that? Well, we ask them a lot of other things too. I mean, there are, there's a whole array of requirements for subdivisions. Right. But subdivisions have the same, the same, sometimes greater impact um, in many ways than, than a solar array would. So it's just interesting to think about. Just a question. Mandy. My hand up was for the next section, but I agree 100% with what Dave just said and will be part of my questions as we get into the substance of Super. particularly the submittal requirements, but also any of the other things um, of why is this different than something else of the same size, it, I think is a good question to keep asking ourselves. Okay, comment from 1708. Andy. So this is where I think a table is more useful yep. than potentially wording. Um, and I'm gonna be suggesting that we put other wording or for now into this, but but um it's you know, this one is 50 feet front yard setback, except if it's a scenic road, and then it's a hundred feet, uh rear and sides are 50 feet, except for uh setting along railroad tracks and then it can be reduced to zero or something with some screening you know i think this is where we should be thinking about even if it's just for our own ability to talk about setbacks creating some sort of table instead of words that show all of the setback and anything measurable distance wise, distance measuring things, whether it be setback, whether it be screening buffers, whether it be X, Y, Z and, and list them all somewhere in numbers and short words type thing so that we can really have a conversation about it. Um, our, our current bylaw uses a dimensional setback table based on zone. Um, looking at that versus use um, could be interesting too, comparing these setbacks to setbacks within the RO or RL, you know, our, our current dimensional table would be helpful as we get into that discussion. But I think a table at this point, this this would be the section that there'd be a table, I, I would suggest potentially a table over words, over sentences. Thank you. Anyone else? Chris? I just wanted to suggest that I'm not proselytizing or anything, but that we keep in mind that um, in some people's minds, large scale in, uh, solar installations are more akin to industrial uh, use than they are to housing, say. And I think there was a concern on the part of the members of the Solar Bio Working Group that people might um, 
have negative feelings about living next to a large scale solar installation as opposed to living next to a housing subdivision. And so they were having that in mind to the extent of, well, should the setbacks for one of these installations be larger than it would normally be? And I think that's a legitimate thing to consider. I'm not arguing in favor of one side or the other, but I think that's what people had in mind when they were setting these um, setbacks differently from the normal setbacks that we have in our dimensional table. Thanks. Sorry, one more thing. Um, so in a normal uh, bylaw use, you know, a use like an industrial use is not allowed in a residential district. It's only confined to, you know, industrial sections or maybe commercial sections. Whereas um, I think that solar installations, large scale solar installations could be in all of the different um, zoning districts. And I think our uh, use table does allow them in all the different zoning districts. You may decide that you don't like that, that you want to confine them to certain zoning districts. But given the fact that they are currently proposed to be allowed everywhere in town, the concern was that, you know, this is something that looks industrial and do you want it next to your house? And if it is next to your house, how far back should it be from your property line? That's all. Thank you. That's, that's a helpful thing to think about. Um, 1709. And, and I'm just going to start out by saying this is incredibly light because they didn't, the, the working group did not address this topic. And um, it, I think it needs, it needs considerable work. I was going to ask if Chris, you could send to the CRC members the solar um, or the battery storage um, bylaw that Ware developed, if that's if that's available. Sure, that's available. Um, but we also developed our own solar bylaw. But the solar bylaw working group wasn't in existence for long enough to review it. So I can send you what Bear put in place, and I can send you what we have drafted. Okay, I'll be happy to do that. And I think the conversation would be: Is it a standalone? We had this at the very beginning, but none of us, you know, had studied it deeply enough. Is it a standalone thing, or is it better um, as part of the solar topic and and have it embedded in in this bylaw, Mandy? Um, similar comments to Pam, um, when we get to this section, I think we need to have a bigger section than this, um, um, and, and start with something, whether it be where, whether it be Pelham, whether you know, Pelham might not have a separate BESS, but, um, there's a number of communities in, in Massachusetts that have drafted either separately or within a solar bylaw, a BESS. Um, starting with that. But then I also want to put into this a comment about as we think about all of the other sections, right? Um, what What is the purpose of the BESS section of this bylaw versus the dimensional standard section or the design standard on glare or setback, you know, dimensional setbacks or buffering and um um you know buffers and vegetative screening and you know does the vegetative screening section apply to BESS as we're discussing those sections are we incorporating are we imagining the screening vegetative screening or the lighting section or the fencing section or some of these other design standard sections or even the ecosystem section um just to throw some things out there as applying to just LGPIs or as applying to BESS2, because as we draft and fix the language in those sections or get that language um, a little more 
cogent, we need to have that consideration in mind, or are we going to literally be repeating in section 1709 dimensional standards and um, uh, screening standards and lighting standards and access standards, um, or should we be doing that? And if we're, if we're including all of those standards up above um, that would apply to both, my question is what actually goes into this section? Um, so, so that that's sort of the the thinking I'm going now. As we need BESS standards, but are they separate or are they incorporated into all of the other sections we've just gone through? Good, Chris. So I think BESS is really different from the standard solar installation. Um, it has many more potential issues. Um, and there are two different kinds. One is the kind that's relatively small and accompanies um, a large scale solar installation. And one is rather large and stands alone. So I think those two um, things need to be considered separately. If it's relatively small and it accompanies an installation of solar panels, then maybe it could be treated in one way, but if it's a large, you know, um, amalgam of, you know, these big, they're like um, shipping containers, sort of. That's what the way they look. Um, if it's a large installation of those, and there's potential for, you know, serious things to happen, maybe we want to treat that differently. So that's something that we need to keep in mind. And I think the bat battery storage bylaw that we wrote, and it's been almost a year now since I wrote it, um, deals with that, but I, I would have to go back and look at it. Anyway, so those are just some, some things to think about, like setbacks. Obviously, those would be different if you had, you know, an, an installation like we're going to see on Route 116 um, up near Annie's former garden center. There's going to be a big installation up there mm -hmm. that was approved by the ZBA last year. Um, and you'd want to make sure that your house was pretty far away from that. But if it's a smaller uh, battery storage that's associated with a solar panel installation, maybe you wouldn't be as worried because there's not a potential for as, as much uh, damage to occur if something goes awry. So well, that's all. <laughs> and we'll get a chance to see it when we see those two examples. So I need to, I need to put a pause. It is it is close to eight o'clock, and I said I'd try to wrap this up quarter of. I want to take the uh, the temperature of the group to either continue this and 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 recognize that we we don't spend as much time on nuisance bylaw, um, or um, pause here. I mean we're making I think we're making good progress. Um, so I'm looking for some feedback and also to, in, to incorporate if there are some comments from the public, um, we might want to pause and take that as well. Andy? Um, well, I would love to continue. I think it's important for us to get and have enough time to do the planning board discussion, yep. uh, which is item two on it. And and we don't know what public comments might be on this one. And so it's probably wise to potentially pause at this point. I lost him. Any, anybody else? I'm, I'm not disagreeing with that. Uh, so if that's the case, it's, it's eight o'clock. We would have another half hour. We do need to talk about, uh, we, I'd like to do public comment um, and then talk about zoning, uh, planning board, excuse me. Um, so let's agree to table this at section 1709. And next time we'll even have some information that we can we can use, maybe. Um, and then, and definitely would like to know to make sure that we have Stephanie back when we start talking about stormwater management. Um, 
with your recommendations that you provided us earlier. Thank you. So we have we can we can let Stephanie and Christine go. Um, and Stephanie, could you kindly email that full document? I guess to why not email it to me and I'll send it to everybody on the committee just so we have a record of of today's accomplishments. Sure, and, absolutely. And, okay. That would be lovely. Thank you. And thank you, Chris and Stephanie, for hanging with us. Appreciate it. Dave, you're still with us, right? If you, if you, if you want to be. Okay, switching gears. Uh, planning board, we have about a month before um, the terms of two current planning board members expire, and we would like very much to have new members in place. Uh, Jennifer, you've been tracking some of this as well. Pam, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, Steve Roof, who was in the audience, did raise his hand. And oh, Okay, I forgot to do the public comment part. So let's open up public comments for comments strictly on solar bylaw and then switch back to, um, to planning board. Sorry about that. Can someone bring Steve Ruth first and then Martha Hanner second? Steve Ruth, Ruth. Hello and good evening. This is Steve Ruth. I live on Southeast Street in deep South Amherst. And um, thank you for all this very detailed work that you are doing going through this draft solar bylaw. I wanted to first mention something you all will find very useful, interesting, and that's the Western Mass Solar Forum that's happening Tuesday of next week. Hope it looks like some of you or many of you are aware of that. That that should be a great event with a lot of really good information happening. And um, I think if, if if folks that are listening Google Western Mass Solar Forum, you will find the way to register and join. It's a, it's all, almost all day Tuesday. It's an online conference, so you can join by Zoom. Um, Second thing I wanted to mention is I wanted to say that I agree entirely with Councillor Haneke and the other councillors that about the nexus statement you were discussing about an hour ago, I think that needs to be removed. The, the, the nexus statements are very one-sided. They give the impression that the Massachusetts decarbonization plan will be achieved if we just protect our forests and the soils and, That's not what it says. and keep farmland as it is. It does, the nexus statements do not mention the key and the core part of the decarbonization plan, which is eliminating the use of fossil fuels. That's 85% of the goal is, is um, eliminating fossil fuels. So I, I think those nexus statements are, are one-sided. I think if, if there's a court challenge, the judge would see that and um, they would not be helpful. Regarding community health and safety, please keep in mind that fossil fuels are killing us. The pollution from fossil fuels kills hundreds of thousands of people um, in the United States and tens of thousands in Massachusetts, uh, in addition to causing sickness, asthma, and others from particulates. So if you want to focus on health and safety, the core thing would be to eliminate fossil fuel use. Um, lastly, I just want to say land preservation goals do not need to be in conflict with responsible solar development. And those nexus statements imply that the, the land preservation goals and preserving forests and soils are in being in, put in danger by solar development. And I think that's wrong. We can develop land. Amherst already has 40% or more of its land under permanent protection. Um, we need to develop solar about eight or nine times more than we have today in Massachusetts to meet the 2050 decarbonization goals. And that means increasing the rate of solar development by a factor of two to three every year. So it's really, really important that solar be encouraged. And that's something that this bylaw, as it is written as now, does not do. It strictly limits, strictly limits and restricts solar development. I think it really needs, something needs to be put in there to find a way to encourage responsible solar development in town that's consistent with our longstanding land preservation goals. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Martha Hanner. Name and name and where you live.
All right, I'm Martha Hanner, living in South Amherst. And uh, first of all, thanks to Steve for mentioning the Solar Forum, which is taking place next week. That's important. Also point out that there was the first part of the Solar Forum was last fall. And one of the things that was stressed and reported on with lots of data in that first forum was that in the past 10 years, the large solar arrays, more than 50% has been due to cutting forests. And um, the state in their documents from the Environmental Protection Agency and so on are uh, putting out as their goals, no further net loss of forest land and no net loss of farmland. In instead, they want to increase the amount of locally grown food. <laughs> so are you still hearing me? Yes. yes. Okay, my computer is going bad a little bit. And, and, and so we, we do have to have the right balance, but the most urgent need is to get solar arrays on parking lots, solar arrays uh, more on buildings. I mean, our town really needs to work hard on this. We, we're going to have the Valley Green Energy then to, to work on this. Um, our two private colleges do have a lot of open land that could be used, say, in collaboration with UMass to do some experimental uh, farmland. So I feel it's really important that the town council take seriously that in addition to reducing the emissions from fossil fuels, uh, and the bigger source of that is transportation, not electricity use at the present time, uh, we also need to really take seriously the role of our open lands and forests in drawing down and storing the carbon dioxide. 50 years from now, that's going to be the most important thing. Uh, and um, climate resilience now is also something we have to take into account and uh, we have to be able to protect our residents. So finally, let me just say that a lot of the concern comes from the region in Northeast Amherst where uh, people are on private wells. And so much of the concern there is the role of forests in helping to protect the, their water supplies and so on. So some of the uh, things that the solar working group discussed uh, in terms of regulations were specific for that region. And so maybe the council wants to consider, you know, different rules for different parts of Amherst or something, but, but that was part of the uh, motivation. So thanks for all your good work. And uh, if you want expertise on the submittal requirements, I suggest that you talk to the ZBA. They're the ones that are going to enforce it. And so they're the ones that best know uh, what they need to see in our solar bylaw for the solar requirements. So thanks for all your good work and keep it up. Thank you, Martha. <laughs> okay, we're gonna close up. that. Good, and now we have the we have a list of candidates or people with community activity forms. I was looking today to see if anyone, uh, they were sent reminders. I was looking to see if anyone had submitted a new CAF. Um, and I have to admit that my inbox is up to 43 on red and I have not seen if any other CAFs. Did anybody else happen to notice? Um, I think you copied me on your emails and I haven't received any. So I think if they submitted CAFs, well, they usually in everyone on the council gets them, but I haven't in response as someone copied on it. I haven't seen any more CAFs. And I will say that uh, we had nine names on the Excel sheet that's available to everyone. And so far, three people have indicated that they're no longer interested in being considered. So we have five names and we're waiting for some of those would have to resubmit caps. We actually, we actually have six names. That's why um, I'm sorry, six names, but they haven't all resubmitted caps. Correct. 
And I will point out that that Doug Marshall um, is currently on the board. He is looking for a renewal of his term or for a second second and a half term. He served a bit. I think he served a year or so before he was uh, appointed to a three-year three term. So we have, in addition to Doug Marshall, we have two other people who have indeed sent in CAFs. And the question before us, given the time frame, do we have a sufficient pool of candidates? And I'm trying to get back and see our faces. So oh, sorry, Andy. So I guess I'm trying to clarify and going back in my own email, the the town council policy says that only those individuals who submitted CAFs after the um, bulletin board notice went up are considered applicants. And is that three people at this point? Yeah. And how many openings are we we're looking to fill two prospective okay. openings? One as a returnee potentially and 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 one as a new lot. Um, and, and in fact, I think we have a I think we have a contradiction in our one of the one of the emails um, and notices that go out to people state that if you if you submitted a calf, you know, recently you do not need to submit a second one or it's actually it says if you submitted it within the last two years, you do not need to submit a new one, but that's contrary to um, our policy or our, at least our practice of asking them to submit it after the bulletin board notice has been posted, which I think is really awful. <laughs> Andy. So we have a month. Terms expire. They don't automatically renew. Um, three for two spots is not necessarily sufficient. Um, yet our options are to go ahead with it now to try and appoint new people despite the potential insufficiency in numbers to get appointments by June 30, by the time the current terms expire, or to say, we're going to extend the current terms and hope we get more. And I feel like the extend the current terms shouldn't be done um, unless we had no applicants, <laughs> you know, like that, that seems like it, it, we have applicants, we might not be happy with the sufficiency of the numbers, but trying to get these appointments done by June 30 seems of those two options, the better option to me than saying we're not going to go forward and instead we're just going to renew, you know, extend someone's term until we try and do this over the summer, which is even harder. <laughs> so I, I, I feel like it's time to say the pool, it, it's necessary to move on. And if we have to declare the pool sufficient to do that, despite our concerns, we need to move on and try to get statements of interest and and interviews in so that we can get these any recommendations to the council by the end of june in fact maybe by june 17 if i'm not mistaken or at least that's what we talked about <clears throat> or the 24th yeah ah you have your hand up yeah and i hear mandy and she makes sense uh I, my concern is uh, and I honestly haven't looked, I mean, I know Doug Marshall, but I don't know who the other people are. So this is no reflection on anyone who has submitted a CAF in the past or now. But if there are two positions and we have three candidates, I would like an assurance from this committee, if only one of those people fits the bill, then 
we don't fill positions with people that we have concerns about. Um, and so my feeling is we ought to extend the present terms and then see if we can get a sufficient pool. Okay, thank you, Pat. My question for um, Pat then would be, what if none of those who are interviewed fit the bill? <laughs> what happens? <laughs> the, the, I, well, I guess my concern, uh, Councillor Ete, is that often we feel like we have to do this unanimous vote. And I think that it would be valuable for us to really vote who we think would make a good planning board member or a good housing trust member or whatever, whatever, some of the other, th not just try to fill a slot. And, I, and I'm very concerned with the drive to fill slots. And, um, and I have purposely not looked because I don't want I don't want to look until the pool is declared sufficient. And, you know, um, I, I'm just concerned that we, <laughs> my personal opinion is that we have a very weakened planning board because of, uh, and, and a very, in, uh, I don't even know. I mean, I feel like we're missing a lot of people who have experience and things like that. And we have a lot of, opinion like I'd be a terrible person on planning board if I applied because I'm so opinionated about certain things and I think that that we've been selecting people based on our personal preferences around where they stand and I'm I'm just I would like some real choices um I will go with the uh, you know I will go with the committee I, you know you know I'm going to do that but I'm just concerned um I don't we shouldn't just vote people on because we don't have enough people. I I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Not saying it's the best argument in the world, but it's where I am. <laughs> um, I agree that I would like to have a wider pool than three candidates for two places. I happen to think that the current planning board is much more balanced than the first planning board. <laughs> Um, which is one reason I ran for council. So we're very different opinions about that. <laughs> um, but I would, so I, I do have a question though. If we do extend it, do we have to, I mean, would we ask the two planning board members whose terms are expiring if they would be willing to serve longer until we fill? And And we would have to go to council and ask for an extension. Similarly, uh, and I don't think we're going to run into this problem um, with the ZBA, but similarly, because because people are on panels for particular projects, they may or, the project may not um, come to a conclusion. And so those those people, whether they are going to continue on as a ZBA member or not, have to be extended to the length of that project so that they can they have a quorum so that they can conclude their business. Um, I don't, I don't know if that's the situation for the planning board, and I should probably ask if, if, um, if that consideration needs to be made for anything that's being continued at this point. Does that make sense? I'm looking at Mandy. So we already did the ZBA appointments without consideration to that, um, but I think we had some information about what they were expecting and when those things were. The ZBA rules under state law are slightly different than the planning board rules. The ZBA rules require the panel to be the same and that panelists can't miss more than I believe it's one meeting. And then even if they miss that one meeting where the hearing is, they have rules about having to make stuff up because it's considered quasi-judicial. The plan board rules are not as strict as that. So the the issue we have with those concerns with ZBA, um, from my knowledge of having spoken and run this process before with planning board are not are not present with the plan planning board, even if there are they are in the middle of site plan reviews, say, um, that those those concerns are not 
legally present, unlike with the ZBA. Thank you. So we don't, I don't think we have to worry about it. In other words. <clears throat> um, I've been thinking about, you know, what, what is an ideal planning board? And, and I would say that sometimes I'm surprised and I'm surprised because people bring with them uh, different experiences, which may not necessarily be, you know, as a professional landscape architect or architect or, you know, trained in some, you know, in engineering, um, but that they bring um, knowledge of other locations and, and how things were done in other places that seem to work <laughs> or ideas that seem to work. So um, I, I know when I served on the planning board, there were people essentially non, uh, I'll call them non-affiliated. They had no background necessarily. They had no particular expertise, but they had an uh, interest in zoning or they had an interest in, um, you know, town affairs or something like that. And and they they listened, they learned, they did their homework and they ended up being contributing members even though um, they weren't experts per se. And I'm, I'm thinking that, again, I have been pleasantly surprised at people that I wasn't sure if they would you know, pull their weight and they ended up. So I think I would, I would probably fall on the side of um, voting the pool sufficient and allowing us to interview and I think in the interview process, it might become very clear that we do or do not have the capabilities that, um, I mean, it's, and it's very hard to say that somebody is incapable of serving on the planning board. That's, that's the dilemma. Take a vote. Are we, do we, are we at consensus that we either extend the terms or to use the, the limited pool that we have? Jennifer. Or, hmm. so I, so you just recently wrote to six people I, or, and I saw three well, emails. So we're still waiting so Actually, we, we may have more than three if some three said they were withdrawing and then I think there's still three um, or two that three, would three, need to submit caps. Well, people that were reminded that a new cap was required um, by our policy and that um, if at all possible, it would be great to have it today because we were going to try to talk about the sufficiency of the pool tonight. Um, unfortunately, I was planning to do that well before Memorial Day weekend, and it ended up not happening. So I had to do it uh, Monday night. So it, it, it's partly my fault that I didn't send a reminder. Um, uh, uh, Mandy. Yeah, so we may get them. We may have more than three is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. But we, I think we can't declare the pool tidied up and, and sufficient until we, because that, that essentially locks the candidates in, right? Andy's shaking her head now. Go ahead. The, even though the pool is, if, the, if we declare the pool sufficient, even if it is declared that the pool is not closed until the statements of interest are published. Okay. Um, but I was going to make a motion because we operate under motions, um, especially when the policy requires us to vote a sufficiency. So um, I, I I don't know whether this will succeed or not, but um, I'm going to move to declare the pool of candidates for the planning board impending vacancies um, sufficient for the purposes of moving towards interviews and soliciting statements of interest. Is there a second? Jennifer, are you raising your, you're raising your yeah, hand? Yeah, no, I, I had to get my mute up. Um, I'll second that. Let's take a vote. Councilor Haneke. 
Aye. Pat D'Angelo. No. Councilor Ette. No. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Pam Rooney. Sophia, yes. So it's kind of a split vote. Um, I appreciate the fact, though, that if we can start the process of asking for statements of interest from those who have submitted that, that fresh calf, and we could easily get two more or three more calves um, so that that so that they are not precluded from the pool, if I understand it right. Does that does that make Pat feel any better? <laughs> no. <laughs> but I don't feel bad. I mean, I lost a vote. I you know I said what I thought and oh, okay. I'm not bad at anybody. <laughs> we're not we're not we're not holding bridges here. Um Councillor Ette, you still have your hand up. Yeah, I, I um I took no on the vote because I was thinking of the charter review, which um, also had a similar situation. And um, while waiting for the statements of intent, the numbers were still low. Um, and um, like Pat, I haven't looked to see who the three candidates are, but I think um, there is a benefit to simply having a bit more and maybe time can give us that opportunity to have more. Mandy. So I think it's up to our chair or her designee to start finding interview dates, um, which is always also a big question mark as to whether we can find interview dates that everyone's available for, especially the closer we get to summer. Um, so I think that's the next step, but I, I do want to reiterate, um, I didn't iterate it the first time, I guess. I do want to support Pat um, and her comment of, if just because we interview people doesn't mean we should feel obligated to a point. Um, you know, I, I think it, it's awkward because the interviews are public and people know we did, but we've been in this situation for many different appointments now, and that awkwardness has potentially um, sometimes resulted in actions maybe a majority of people weren't comfortable with because we we didn't we wanted to avoid the awkwardness um without saying anything because we don't know what the interviews will do right um the, the awkwardness is because we have to do all of this in public um not you know in, in some sense so i i don't know i i think we need to think of that as a possibility that it's not we're interviewing X number of people and we are absolutely filling X number of spots. I think it's we're interviewing X number of people and we may be filling X number of slots and and just rethinking that thought process. Yeah. Oh wait, one other thing with that is rethinking the one thing we haven't done before is if we only get one SOI, considering whether we even want to move to interviews or something, you know, um, a rethinking the declaration of the sufficiency of the pool, potentially at that interview stage or a meeting before the interviews when we're sitting there going, now that we know our pool, mm -hmm. trying to make that consider, consider, you know, that decision without even reading the SOIs is very complicated, but because then you have more information and then other things get in there. But but being able to say, revisit the sufficiency decision uh, on based on some of the stuff that Councillor Ette just said, you know, you can start with 10 potential, we've seen this in ZBA before, 10 potential applicants and end up with two statements of interest. 
<laughs> and, and then you're like, but we had four slots, you know, what do we do? Um, uh, being able to be open and, and reconsider some of those decisions as neutrally as possible. Um, Can I ask when the charter review, um, do, are you at a point where they're going to do inter interviews yet? We next literally, week. during this, I think we just next got a week. notice that they're going to be next week. No, no, June 4th. June 4th at 6.30. That's so great. there were a couple of people that said they were interested in planning board, but they preferred um, the charter review. Yeah. So if they weren't there, maybe they, yeah. Yeah. They might come back and submit a new cast. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's very good to know. Good. Um I'm looking at the calendar and um, I think we have to have uh, our statements of interest about 10 days before the interview so that there's time to get them in, get them to Athena and have them posted for a week. Um, it seems like the earliest that we could do an interview would be uh, the very end of the week of the 10th. So the 14th or the 17th, 18th, 19th would be ideal. Um, are any of those? I have to get my calendar. Okay. Well, do we have a CRC meeting where we could? I mean, because that's the easiest. We know we all have that on our calendars. We have a, a CRC on the 11th and on the 25th, but the 25th, is a day after the last council meeting for the month of June. So I would really like to have, um, you know, it could perhaps be the 18th, which is which is a, a Tuesday evening. So hopefully most of us would have our Tuesday evenings, this time slot available, at least target that. Uh, that would be the best for me. Are there, um, I'm looking at Council Ete and, and Pat's coming back. Are there any mornings? Because sometimes we've had luck, you know, having a an eight o'clock in the morning kind of a thing so people can do it before they go to work or lunchtime or evening on other other nights. What at the, can you refill at the, me in on what dates you're talking about? Sure. I apologize. Um, ideally, it would be, uh, it could be on the perhaps on the 18th, which is a Tuesday evening, which would otherwise be our CRC meeting, but we don't have a meeting that day. Um, so we might be free on the 18th in the evening. Um, but we're looking at, you know, even Monday the 17th at some other time of the day than, than our council meeting or the 14th. And the only reason is that we we want to give a little time for the CAFs to come in and we need 10 days for the um, statements of interest to be submitted ahead of the interview. Yeah. Mandy. When you're... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, I'm Pat. I'm going to raise my hand, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. oh, Mandy. So I think a survey is the best yeah. Uh, option to do because it's not just us that have to be free. It's the applicants themselves and they're not here. Um, so I would, again, suggest a wide variety of dates and times throughout the day. Um, Wednesday, June 19th is a federal or at least a state holiday. I'm not sure if it's formally a federal holiday. It's Juneteenth. And right. so the national holiday. That, that is that is. Probably it, it should be off limits because of staff time for required stuff, no matter what. We don't tend to have meetings on on holidays, on state or federal holidays. Um, and so I just wanted to bring that up on in terms of when surveying people that June 19th should be avoided. Yep. Thank you. Any anybody have a, a specific day or time that they know they can't be available? Yeah. yeah, I can't be available. I think you said the 14th, 18th, yeah. rather. 
Uh, the 14th during the day, I'm not available and I don't want to do anything Friday nights. The 18th, I'm available. Um, and I'm not available on Wednesday, the 19th or uh, in the evening or um, Thursday, the 20th in the evening. What are you? We have GOL then. And okay. I have the Amherst Mobile Market Board meeting on the 19th. Okay. So anytime up to 5, five o'clock might work? May, on the 19th? Yeah. But the 19th yes, is the holiday, so we're not going to have. Right, right, right. right. We, I'm sorry. Uh -huh, right. So okay. we're talking about, um, yeah. No, Thursday, you said you have GOL. So Thursday would have to be before yeah. 7. I think most of us have some daytime flexibility, except for Councillor Ette. So I think yep. you should hear from him. Yes, I'm waiting for him. He's next. Thank you. Um, I'll actually be on a trip out of town, um, 19th, 20th, and 21st. You are away? Yes. Okay. And no access to computers. <laughs> Except I carry a laptop to a black tie event, then sure. Oh. <laughs> I, that would be fun. We would feel included. <laughs> you could even have a drink. Yeah. So I think 18th works well for me, actually. So we'll, we'll hopefully we can focus on that day. Thank you. Not, not and I was going to say the week before, if it's the week of um, June 10th, I could only do it in the evening. The whole week? Yep. Okay. Okay, well, let's keep it as a possibility. So could we, since we all know that all of us have June 11th, would we want to devote a CRC meeting to it if that if it comes to that makes sense okay mm -hmm. so if that's the case then we would need to have them submit their SOIs by the end of this week like in three days that's too ambitious I think it's 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 maybe not ambitious but it's rude since it's been going on for months and then finally we go okay yeah we can't do that Okay, so, uh, so we're looking at the week of the 17th, except that's, okay. But even even if it's toward the end of the week, so the like the 13th or 14th, did we just say that? That would, that would mean that we have, they have maybe five or six days to get a statement of interest in. While you're thinking, I'm going to call on Mandy. I'm going to reiterate that I really encourage us to do this with a survey and all because okay. we're not everyone. And some of us are not necessarily comfortable in the middle of an open meeting publicly disclosing calendars and availabilities. Um, and <laughs> but but we're missing the most important people. But I, I also want to iterate, given the timeline, we may not be able to get all five committee members present. Okay. Um, okay. And I say that because it might be me. <laughs> yeah, I, might, I, I don't want to exclude me from that. And and that's something that that we might have to make a decision on, on again, hard choices, right? Of, of what do you give up, all five members, um, or meeting the the 24th deadline or going a week without a plan, you know, or aiming for, I don't know when our July, I think the 15th is the first council meeting oh, or months. two weeks, you know, what, at, or suggesting because things don't quite work out in June, going to the council for June 17th and saying, you know, or whatever, and saying we need the, these terms need to be extended two weeks because we're not going to have interviews till mid July. You know, I mean, there there's potential possibilities, but we won't know until we actually survey the people we need to interview. Um, and, and, so we, 
we, we yeah. try to block out what we know doesn't work for most of us. So that's, right. I that's mean, fine. I'm not going to even put out the dates when Councilor Ette isn't. So it's helpful knowing that I won't put that on the, you know, whatever Google calendar. It's not the Google calendar, but the form that we use. I guess what I'm saying is if we all put our availability out there, there might not be any date that all five of us are actually available in the evening. Okay, so um, what we had decided for ZBA when it looked like you couldn't make it to the interviews is you were going to listen to the recording and then we were going to vote at another meeting. So we could do that. Right, which is why I'm saying we need to just send out the survey yeah. to everyone and actually figure out when applicants are available and who might of committee members might or might not be available on whatever dates that I don't think we can deal with it in this meeting right now because we don't even have everyone that we need to have. Okay, so we will, Jennifer, 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 Jennifer and I will collaborate on getting the poll put out and we will um, we will give a broad array of dates. In the meantime, I will remind the folks again who had who need to submit a CAF before their statement of, and their statement of interest, right? They, we need to have a CAF in hand and a statement of interest. I'm looking right. at I'm looking at Mandy. Yes, you cannot under the council policy, you a person is not considered an applicant for the purpose of getting to interviews unless both a CAF and statement of interest have sub been submitted and that CAF has to have been submitted after the bulletin board notice was posted according to the policy the council adopted. Okay, so we need to bring this up as a, a policy change because our wording in the letter says something different. Yeah. Okay, good. So we'll we'll take care of that and um, let you all know. And you can still encourage people to apply. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So sorry that took so long. Uh, let's get back. I have no. Um, hold on. I'm looking for my agenda. Okay, uh, nuisance bylaw. We will we will tackle. I hope nuisance bylaw next time. And um, it was very helpful to read the comments from GOL, um, and hopefully we'll have a chance to read those before we get to the meeting itself. Um, Can I just say? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I all of the nuisance bylaws I clicked on did I couldn't see the GOL comments. Is it? Are they in track they're, changes? I mean, they're all the track changes. There's dozens of track changes on the side. I, it was it coming up on what I, hmm. maybe you could send me yours. Okay. <laughs> yeah. it. Thank you. I just opened it from the packet. Um, I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, even if it's a hard copy, I could get you a hard copy perhaps. Yeah. And I'm, I'm have, obviously having technical difficulty. Okay. Um, we have had no minutes to approve for months and months, and I'm believing that it's probably staff shortage and the just lack of time to do this kind of bookkeeping. Um, but we probably haven't had meeting, meeting minutes since I was chair. Uh, no announcements. Surprise, surprise, next agenda preview, solar bylaw, nuisance bylaw, planning board appointment conversation. Items not anticipated, none. I think we're ready to adjourn. Anyone Take a vote. <laughs> I move to adjourn. I second it. <laughs> okay. uh, we're voting. Aye. Pam, aye. Mandy. Aye. You don't sound happy. Jennifer. Yes. Councilor Ette. Aye. Andy, write me if you had a, if you needed to try to get something else. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.